morning. So according to the program, this talk is in English. So excuse me. <laughs> okay. Um, it's morning. I'm really excited to see you all here. Um, let's cheer up a little bit. Just put a smile on your face and let's take a photo. One moment. Okay. Woohoo! Cool. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's do it. So today we're talking about the role of a solution architect in a software project. Um, small disclaimer here. So everything you see here or here or uh, or whatever, uh, everything is a product of a production and research experience and reading some books actually. So um, please accept it as is. There are no guarantees. This is all true. Okay, about me, my name is Vladimir Ivanov. I'm lead software engineer in EPM Systems. Uh, we call it primary skill, so my primary occupation is Android development. I'm doing mobile applications for more than, more than seven years, but it's not the limit for my technical interests. Uh, I'm doing some cross-platform mobile development with React Native, for example, and uh, I'm doing solution, architect for, solution architecture from time to time for different projects. Uh, recently, I passed the uh, Google Cloud Architect certification, and that was tough, but cool. Okay, so I got that kind of beige for that. Okay, so let's get to know each other. Please raise your hand. Who is a software developer? Like, writing code every day. Okay, good. Uh, a lot of you. Uh, what about QA engineers? Eventually, virtually no, <laughs> no QA engineers here. Okay, one. Uh, what about managers, like program managers, five, six, seven delivery managers, resource managers? What kind of managers you do know? <laughs> okay, uh, any architects, solution architects, enterprise architects? Okay, okay, two. You colleagues can correct me if I'm if, if I'm bullshitting you. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so. There are different phases of the projects, but uh, usually developers know only one of them. It's a construction phase. But actually for the software services company, uh, there are much more. And uh, we're going to go through all of them today. So there are verify, request for information, request for proposal, uh, then engagement, discovery, construction, you all know, and transition. Okay, let's go just one by one. First one is Request for information, this is a very simple stage. Uh, basically, a customer reaches you uh, with questions, and they want to know what software development capabilities you have. Are you proficient with mobile development? Do you know how to build uh, web applications with Node.js? Uh, can you customize some Drupal-based sites? And so on. And uh, this is the moment when Solution Architects begins his work, right? Uh, his responsibility is to answer those questions. And of course, uh, you can't know everything. You can't know the answer for each of those questions. And if you don't, uh, you're going to reach some architects of related fields. For example, your primary uh, occupation is mobile development, uh, the same as myself. And they ask you about Drupal or other web technologies. And you're going to find the architects in that field and ask them those questions and provide his or her answers to the customer. And if you don't have such experts, for example, the customer wants to know if you have any experience with blockchain, you're, you can't just answer that, I don't know anything about it. It's not serious, right? Uh, you're going to do some research and answer that, we have some information about that field, we know that and this, uh, so we can do something for you. Okay, this is a simple stage. The next one, if the previous goes really well and the answers are good, you're going to uh, have a request for proposal. Uh, this is the beginning of real work because they want to know how much money and time you require to build some kind of software project, right? So you, you get a letter or a document or whatever with some kind of requirements and vision and so on. And our solution architect is going to understand what is the business value for that software project because no software is written just to be written, right? They, that software should earn some money. They should bring some business value, and our architect should understand what is the value of a concrete request. Then uh, the architect is going to create a solution architecture, right, to draw some fancy diagrams uh, to understand which components are required for, for that solution. And if the architect knows which components exist in that architecture, uh, then he can understand 
which teams are required to implement that solution. Uh, because you don't generally do only one part. You're creating a system, right? So you will need a backend, uh, a front-end, a load balancer, a mobile application, a website, a data storage, and so on. And for each of those components, you will require a separate team or a separate person, or maybe a person who works on several components simultaneously. If you know the teams, you then uh, create a resource plan. This is a document that describes which persons of which occupation, like senior developer, team lead, solution architect, delivery manager, QA lead, uh, QA engineer, QA automation engineer, and so on. And uh, this is the base for the cost calculation, right? Because if you're a software services company, like IPM, uh, what you sell is the time of your engineers. So we want to, to position ourselves like a software services, but basically we, <laughs> we sell the time of our people, right? So when you have the resource plan, you know the time and money uh, you need to create that solution, to implement that solution. And this is the information that the customer wants to know, right? So this is the answer to the request for proposal. OK, good. What about the next phase? The next phase is engagement. And our solution architect does really little uh, in that part. Maybe he consults the account manager or delivery manager and just reaches the customer to ensure that we have all the technical possibility to, to do the project. Uh, but the most interesting part is the next one, is the discovery. OK, let's talk about discovery. Uh, the main goal of that phase is the requirements gathering. Because without requirements, you can't really understand what you need to do and uh, how much money you really need. Because in the previous phase, you have just a short vision of what you're going to build. But, um, only discovery can, answers, can answer all your questions. So our requirements could be, first of all, functional, right? We all know what functional requirements is. Uh, Non-functional and constraints. OK, let's talk about each of them. First of all, functional requirements. This is really easy. I believe everyone uh, can give me some examples of functional requirements. For example, the system should allow an administrator to log in, right, to get into the system. OK, pretty clear. Or the system should show the list of users to the logged in administrator. Pretty clear as well. And uh, we basically don't have any issues with those functional requirements because they are clear. And if they are not, we can pose just a couple of questions and get all the answers we need. The more interesting part is non-functional requirements because those requirements tell us how the functional requirements should be implemented. Because, for example, uh, the system should allow an administrator to log in. Will you be satisfied if it will take 20 minutes? I believe nobody will. So we need to gather non-functional requirements that tell us how our system should behave and how it should implement our functional requirements. For example, if you have some security requirement, like the application should use TLS 1.2, for all connections involving user data. OK, so here you understand that HTTP is not the choice of your architect, OK? Or maybe the application should open the page under half a second. 20 minutes is not satisfying, right? So half a second is OK. Or maybe the application should be available 23 hours a day. Or maybe 23 hours and 59 minutes. OK. Aside of functional and non-functional requirements, there are constraints. Uh, those requirements are not dependent on the customer or on you or on whatever else. They are just given facts. For example, customer already has a license uh, for Azure Cloud. And they just tell you that we already have a license. We don't accept GCP. We need to use Azure. You can't do anything with that. Or maybe the application should implement some federal law regarding yeah, the, the data. Uh, if you build a medical solution, right, or you build some financial thing, you will have a lot of constraints here because it's just life. OK, why those requirements are important? Why we tell, uh, talk about them so much? Because some of them will change the architecture a lot. And that means that will change the cost a lot. For example, if you have an availability requirement, and availability is uh, usually given in some number of nines, for example, 99.9 .9 or 99.95 .9 or 
or 99.99999. There's a service I know, uh, Google Cloud DNS, that provides 100% availability, but this is the only one, I believe. And every additional nine of your availability requirement is going to double the complexity of your system. And that means doubling the costs, right? So this is a disaster, and you need to know those numbers precisely before you do the actual project. And of course, the earlier you understand that you have some requirements, and the earlier you can avoid some errors, the cheaper it will be to fix the problems that you will come up with during the project. Okay, the main source of our requirements are stakeholders. Who they are? They are the people who have an interest in your project. So there are a lot of people, actually, for each of the projects you can meet in your professional life. Uh, first of all, customer business representative, right? Those are main guys that drive all the deal. Maybe delivery organization business representative, so your account managers, your, I don't know, C CEO, and so on. Uh, technical folks from both sides, right? So customer can have their own developers, IT department, solution architects, QA engineers, and so on. Of course, you will have them too. So your developers, your QA engineers, your managers, yourself, uh, all technical faults. End users, of course, are interested in your project because uh, your project is going to bring some business value to them as well. And competitors. Of course, your comp uh, competitors of your customer are not going to be interested in a successful completion of the project because they're going to ruin their business in a, in a good case. So there are, uh, those are interested people, and uh, you need to listen to them very well. So in order to gather requirements, you need to talk to those stakeholders. Uh, that's obvious on this step. And the stakeholders' identification is one of the main responsibilities of a solution architect. So that's basically what you do like half of the time. We're talking a lot about architecture, but we didn't give any definition. Uh, there's a very smart book, Software Architecture in Practice, from the Software Engineering Institute. And the definition is that the architecture is the set of structures needed to, to reason about the system which comprises software elements, relations among them, and properties of both. Does anybody understand anything? I don't. Well, actually, I do. <laughs> but uh, from the first sight, you don't understand anything. And there are like three pages in this book that explains that this definition is really correct comparing to other definitions and so on. But uh, now we can understand that architecture is a key to the system to the system properties, uh, which the end user is concerned about. So when we were talking about the performance, this is really concerning for your end users, and you need to uh, design for, uh, for that requirement. Or maybe your product owner or some business representative think that those requirements are important. They can be wrong, but they think so. So in general, there are no good or bad architectures. There are architectures that fit the target system properties, and the architectures, they just simply don't. Okay, so the target system properties that we're talking about, uh, which affects the architecture significantly, they unsurprisingly called architecturally significant requirements or ASRs. And the architects are just, when they chit chat uh, during their coffee, they, did you gather all the ASRs? Okay, of course I did. Okay, uh, let's go further. How to identify ASRs? How do you do your job? So you can review some requirements documents, and of course, there will be some lists. Uh, you can interview stakeholders, and there are separate processes on how to do that well, for example, with quality attribute workshops. Uh, again, uh, those are complicated processes, actually. By understanding the business goals, so for example, you're, built, you're building a mobile application and you want to engage some people, you of course understand that those applications should be performant because if they are, don't, if they are not, the user is going to uninstall them just in a second. And there is some tool, uh, it is called Utility Tree. It is really helpful to uh, gather though, uh, those architecturally significant requirements. How to use it? Uh, let's check. Well, what you do, you're going to interview your stakeholders with quality attribute workshops, or just one by one, or whatever. And you're going to gather just a list of requirements. Different ones. For example, under normal load, the web page is displayed within half a second. Uh, by the way, those requirements uh, in that formula are called uh, quality attributes. 
because they provide uh, precise numbers on your non-functional requirements. Another example is, well, in case of system failure, new instance or your application is up in under 30 seconds. Okay, what do you do with those lists? You categorize them by, uh, by what they tell you about. For example, the first three ones are about the response time of your system, right? Uh, the last ones are about compliance or user experience. When you grouped those requirements uh, by their mean, uh, you can group them in, uh, in some larger groups. So for example, response time and latency uh, of the group performance. And uh, the last one is compliance, it's for usability, and so on. So you see that you have a tree-like structure, uh, and you see all the requirements, and it really helps to, to understand uh, how you're going to design your system to address all of those requirements. OK, cool. So you gathered all the requirements. You came up with the solution architecture. You spent a lot of time with it. And now you need to uh, document it. How? With some notations, of course. So there are three kinds of notations. Uh, this is the definition from a software engineering institute, again. So first ones are non-formal notations with general purpose diagramming. So you're, you can just take word or paint or whatever other tool and draw some rectangles. And this will be non-formal notation. And they require a, leg a legend, right? So to bring value. The next one are semi-formal notations, and they have standardized notation. So they provide some meaning for those rectangles. And you can, uh, you can think that other architects, they know that notation, and they can understand what you're drawing. And the last one are the formal notations. And they differ from previous one uh, with precise semantics, right? So uh, you can know that. Uh, some rectangle brings some value, but only in formal notations, uh, there are precise meaning. So you don't need to pose any other questions to understand what the diagram is about. Okay, let's take a look on some examples. So you cannot read like uh, the titles here, just the picture. Uh, you clearly see that this is a non-formal notation because there are just drawings, some homes, some squares, some servers. And uh, of course, the architect who does that, uh, he, need to, he needs to provide a legend, right? To, to provide the meaning to the diagram. Another example is this one. I believe you don't see anything here, but there are a lot of errors here and uh, rectangles and braces and labels and so on. And this is semi-formal notation. So uh, this is UML 2.0, I believe. Uh, but you don't need a legend to understand that. However, you can't use uh, some verification, so some software to prove that this, this architecture means anything. Okay, let's go further. Uh, in formal notations, you can, do, uh, you can use some software to do that. Okay, so documenting the architecture is the, the third most important activity for a solution architect. And uh, of course, you don't share only diagrams with other architects or with your customer or whatever. You provide documents, for example, solution architect document, and there are a lot of templates for those. We have some internal ones. The Solution Engineering Institute have a lot of them, and so on. Okay, uh, the next phase is actually construction. And during construction, our solution architect can do a lot as well. So they don't just share the solution architect document and wave you and the, bye bye, I'm not gonna develop that. Okay, he, he's going to do that. Uh, he's going to bootstrap the development, so maybe create some project templates and so on, write some code, uh, define and set up quality gates, and this is really important because we were talking about some architecturally significant requirements. And if your system doesn't fit them, doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't satisfy them, then when you're going to show the system to your customer, they will not be satisfied as well, and they're not going to pay you. So architect is uh, here to ensure that those requirements will be met. And for those, he, uh, he set up some quality gates. So for example, he, set, he sets up some um, automated tests that ensure that uh, the system behaves really performant like it was in the requirements. And maybe 
architect creates some proof of concepts. Uh, if you need to integrate with some third party systems or use some hardware, this is the responsibility of a solution architect. And of course, he's going to share some knowledge with developers, with QA engineers, with delivery managers, and other managers. Okay, uh, the last phase solution architects plays role in is transition. What is transition? Uh, there are two types of transition of a software project. First one is to production. And this is the case of success. Like, you did everything you wanted, and you're going to deploy your system, and architect helps you to, uh, to bring it live. Like, Right, deploy to the production cloud or to production system and so on. Another type of transition is a transition to other team. There are several cases here because, uh, for example, you can, uh, your system may be a part of a larger system and you completed your work, but it's not going to, pr uh, going to go to production. It's going to be a part of a bigger one. Or maybe you're not doing great and uh, the project is transferred from your software services company to other one. Or maybe you just change the team, right? So you change the location. For example, you're doing it in Belarus and uh, you want to move it to St. Petersburg and so on. So this is a transition. This is a knowledge sharing and so on. Okay. So summing it all up, the person who identifies stakeholders, gathers architecturally significant requirements, building the architecture, documenting it, sharing it, bootstrapping some of the system components, that person is usually called a solution architect. In EPAM, we have a really sophisticated definition of who a solution architect is, and this is a huge list. I'm going to share some, uh, some examples. For example, we require practical experience with more than 10 projects in relevant engineering domain. For example, 10 mobile applications or 10 web applications or whatever. Um, good knowledge of architectural theory, because you need to communicate with stakeholders, to communicate with other solution architects, with enterprise architects, and so on. You need to have a, to, to be on the same page, right? And, for example, an ability to identify stakeholders and communicate with them. This is crucial, right? We figured that out. Okay, so a couple of useful links. Uh, if you want to become a solution architect or want to become a better solution architect, uh, there's a great article uh, of the colleague of mine. Uh, he's called Nikolai Ashanin. And he wrote uh, a, an article about the books in software architecture. This is not a plain list. There is a rating and comments and so on. So you can choose the best one for yourself. Uh, there are a couple of courses. For example, Amazon Cloud Architect Associate. This is a great course. Uh, it costs like 15 bucks. So it's basically free for that kind of course. So just enroll. The next one is Google Cloud Architect Professional, uh, the one I took in order to pass the certification. It's a great course that not, uh, not only giving you the knowledge of um, uh, how you use GCP, but what architectural principles you apply to build a performance, scalable, large systems. And uh, yeah, I engage you to, uh, to enroll. And that's it. So there are a couple of contact information. You can reach me by Work in email, follow me on Twitter, please, it's really important. Uh, follow me on Medium. Uh, I write a lot about mobile uh, application development and data development and uh, cryptography and so on. So I expect you to reach me and to talk about a little more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm not sure that, is it okay with this microphone? Yes, uh, so we have time for several questions. Uh, uh, probably both English and Russian are okay. Yes? Yeah, Use sure. Uh, hello? Oh, okay. oh hello. <laughs> Interaction <laughs> cube. So. Talk, talk, talk to the box. <laughs> Is there some special yeah. name for this device already? Oh, Xbox, yeah. Xbox. Uh, I want to ask about agile technology when a requirement may, may change during uh, develop, development process when, for example, customer initially wants to chat and to end of a product uh, he wants to chat with video calls. Uh, when uh, handle these changes and uh, how to process it? Well, um, I believe I can answer that question. So uh, almost all of our processes are agile. So we got the requirements in an agile style. We develop the product with iterations with Scrum and so on. So we're trying to, to show the result as uh, fast as possible in order to have the feedback as soon as possible. And if the customer understands that uh, he wants to change anything, uh, 
we just look on the on that change, and if it is a really small one, just add some button here. Uh, we're just doing it, and uh, it, it, of course it depends on the type of engagement or on type of the contract. Because if you have a time and material, if you have uh, a fixed price and so on, there are nuances. But this is a responsibility of account manager, really. But if we see that uh, the architecture will change with that requirement, this is a definitely a change order. And we're trying to communicate. So this is a huge, huge change. We need to change the architecture, add another team to, uh, to satisfy this requirement. So this is a separate money, a separate contract, and so on. And it happens all the, all the time. This is, this is life. <laughs> OK? So more questions. I'll take yeah, this. cool. Vladimir, you mentioned that uh, you are preparing uh, documents. What is the main document you prepare, or a colleague of yours, and what does that document include? OK, so uh, during the engagement, we prepare like 10, 10 documents, I believe. So it's a resource plan, a agile project management plan, a risk management plan, statement of work, um, solution architect document, and the later. Uh, is the document that actually solution architects writes. So solution architecture document. It includes like everything. Uh, the architecturally significant requirements, the diagrams. It may include baseline architecture if we're in brownfield and we need to transit the system from previous state to a new state. The, the target architecture with several views, uh, the description of all of the components, but it depends on the customer, of course, because for some customers, we prepare only high-level architecture. So those are the blocks, this one, this one, this component, and that's it. And for some, we provide really detailed architecture. So for example, the architecture of particular components of mobile applications. So this module in this mobile application consists of those components and so on. Um, did I answer the question? Ah, we have a discussion zone, I believe, there. We can talk a little yes, bit yes, more. Yes, there is, there is space for more detailed discussion, so please. Okay. Ah, you mentioned uh, you, uh, sorry, uh, you mentioned you uh, uh, use uh, some diagrams for uh, requirement specification, uh, for functional requirements. Uh, did you use some kind of uh, BDD uh, specification or uh, this? Well, I, I, I never did. Why so? <laughs> because this is a one of the way to, 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 yeah, to be linked yeah, to the stakeholders, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's very, it's very I just, just don't have such experience. <laughs> so, more? Here, here it is. Yeah, thanks. Not, not, uh, not right way, so you, you have to, to throw it. <laughs> so, <that's laughs> okay. um, so you described like ideal process when you have a solution to guide in the project through all the steps. Uh, and controlling the process on each step, which is quite good, but that's not how it often happens in real life. Uh, often you have uh, already developed product that, that works, and you need to uh, to continue to develop it and to uh, to extend it and to broaden it. Okay. Uh, so I believe the solution active role in this case is a little bit different. So could you please comment on this situation? Uh, well, of course, uh, there are a lot of situations. Uh, well. When you have a brownfield, right, and you need to transit something. I'm sorry, you have what? Sorry? You have what? Brownfield. Brownfield. So there are, there are two approaches, brownfield and greenfield. Greenfield, when you don't have anything, right, and you're building a solution from scratch, and brownfield, you already have a system, and you need to do something with it. Uh, and of course, uh, there will be difference, because uh, you will you will begin with the architectural review. So when you gather some requirements, right, because you need to do something with the system. Uh, you will not just step into architecture. You will begin with the architectural review. And this is a separate process. Uh, I haven't a lot of experience with that, but whatever. Uh, you need to understand, you, you need to gather all the documents that describe in the system and maybe write some missing parts and then make, make a conclusion. If that system will target your, your properties, right, so your quality attributes, and if it is not, then come up with a new architecture that will fit your business requirements better. Okay? Yeah, I believe this is a very broad topic, so thanks. Okay. We okay. Later. So we probably have time for one more question for this talk. So here. Okay. Um, it's a good case when we have an N-flow from the beginning, RFP, RFP, and so on from development. But usually we met N situation when you have to assess 
assessment an existing project, maybe not only your company, maybe external company. Yeah, yeah. And in that case, uh, we need to prepare an assessment plan. Uh, can you suggest any framework or methodology how we can prepare an assessment plan to assess external or internal project when the architect comes uh, and have only one or two weeks to understand uh, because it's the stakeholders and so on? Mm, unfortunately, I can't suggest some frameworks, but um, in my understanding, uh, what you need to do is you need to go on site, right, uh, right to the customer and uh, identify uh, the most important people there and uh, try to communicate with them as much as you can uh, in order to understand what happens now and what is the most dissatisfying thing about their solution at the moment. And then just proceed. So I okay. think that, that's been a good question for a separate presentation topic. I yeah, think yeah so I believe so. 30 or 40 minutes, so I think at least. So I have to stop the discussion right now because we have to allow people to change the rooms so you can find the speaker close to our room for some additional discussion. Thank you very much. So Thank you. Thank you. Small break here.